Thank you, Ken. Uh, if I could have the speakers come up, if we, if we could have the slides off. I think we've had, um, this panel's been a great example of the range of perspectives uh, that we will have in this. So um, uh, we already have questions. So um, I just want to throw out, um, so Ken, you, you've, you've raised the issue that um, open data sharing models could create a disincentive for the VCs that potentially mm -hmm. uh, invested in you. So I, I'd like to sort of see if you could tease out the thread of if how, what what could be considered to address some of those concerns because I, I don't see our panel as necessarily addressing the financial <laughs> situation. But you know, if this is going to be a real barrier, um, what what could be done to overcome that? And then I'll um, ask Steve and Artie to. I'm mightily concerned that I don't know the answer, and I've been thinking about this. So um, I'll give you an example. Look, the, there's an economic model, you can like it or not, called the capital asset pricing model. Stock price is the present value of future earnings discounted for risk, all right? So anything you do that decreases your future earnings or anything you do that increases your risk decreases your value and decreases your investment. It's, it's really a fundamental law of economics. So uh, I give you an example, I, not because I have an answer, but because I don't, of BARDA. The Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority was formed after September 11th. Um, its idea was to fund biotechnology companies and others to develop products for the government for medical countermeasures. And it spawned a lot of activity in companies who were formed and venture capitalists who set up funds to invest in the biotech business. The first time the government exercised its sovereign right to cancel a project because it changed its priorities, the industry started drying up. Um, the government has the right to change its mind. It's always been written there, but people didn't really think about the risk associated with that. So you have a risky product development effort, and now you have the risk the funding can go away. So you have companies with half a billion to billion dollars worth of future government revenue with market capitalizations that are hard to calculate because the risk of these ventures is so high. So why I think about this. Everybody has good intentions going into what you're talking about. And someday, it was talked about a little bit before, some researcher does an analysis while, which, while incorrect as it is, absolutely destroys a marketed pharmaceutical product. And there's no way to counter that because it's done once it's done. You can never rebuild a reputation once it's lost. The value of the entire industry will decline at that moment if everybody has to share data and the risk exists for everybody that that mistake can happen again and again and again. So unless you can guarantee perfection, you're running that risk. And the first time it happens, you will start to see the consequences in the valuations of this industry and the willingness of people to invest in these high-risk ventures. There's a, I've been through it. This is my fifth company, actually. There's a 90% probability of failure. I have those under my belt. Um, and you just need to think about that from that perspective. Extraordinarily high risk, unfortunately, requires extraordinarily high returns, or it's not going to happen. So there you go. Thank you. Um, Atul, it looks like you wanted to. Yeah, um, are you OK I'll with us Steve. discussing with each other here? Um, so I'm clearly on one uh, uh, polar. But I went to Stanford, so it's OK. Excellent. So we're on the same team here. All right, so two, two points I just want to raise. So first of all, we've already heard companies are now already voluntarily sharing their data. So aren't you now, in some ways, lacking public trust? And what would you do about it? Um, well, I'm not sure how lack. Well, let's go talk about this. Some companies are sharing data, and for them, that's their decision. Um, but they, I would suggest, are probably larger companies. I'd love to share placebo data. We just ran the first placebo trial in a particular therapeutic. But they're sharing everything, so and, now and, you're and, behind, right? And would, so let me ask you a different question. If you had a choice between my developing a new drug or sharing data, knowing that if I do that, I won't have the resources to invest in a new drug category, which would you choose? Which so, would you choose? And by the way, my life, life is not meant, when it was a concept before about, I'm sorry to do this, but let's go do some third rails. It's really nice that we can get academic people promoted, but nobody's going to do research for a year and say, hey, whoopee, I proved they were right. The concept is you want to tr you're creating controversy. That's what you're doing in this question. And if your idea is to create controversy, then what you're going to do is create risk. And you're actually, an unintended consequence is you're going to lower the probability investment in the business. So let me ask you in a positive let's, way then. Let's right? give okay. the rest yeah. of the panel a chance to get it. We can continue this. So is it already or Steve? Uh, either way. Uh, although I, I'm kind of following up directly on that exchange. So, so the model I think that 
one could imagine would be that um, data sharing would only occur after a drug is approved. And so two things. First, um, that would lead to presumably in most cases, not in all cases, um, but in most cases, unless you're a fully integrated biotech company, you you outlicense your, at some point, you outlicense to a big pharma, right? To Not necessarily. Okay, but I mean, in the mine run of cases, small biotechs don't take it all the way through FDA approval. It, well, unfortunately for that model, we plan to, so I don't know how Right, so you, I don't know whether you're typical in that situation. So, yeah. so, uh, so th I think the, the, the question would be, you know, if, if data release is limited to a situation where the drug approval <coughs> has already taken place, uh, at that point, the risk is basically, as you suggested, a, a, a liability or tort liability mm -hmm. risk or a reputational risk. Mm -hmm. um, and you're saying that it would be much, uh, it, it, your ability to bear that risk would be much lower than that of a big pharma company. Yeah, we're still in the investment stage and still building a company. And what you're, the, the unintended, con one of the unintended uh -huh. consequences, I cannot begin to think of them all, is the need to create an entire group to monitor and manage that process or mm -hmm. think about it differently. No doubt our insurance costs would go up. So mm -hmm. when we closed down Alteon, we paid, a th we th play, paid three quarters of a million dollars for a liability tail on that particular company at that time. Now imagine that somebody could analyze the data and sue you five years later or ten years later. So should we have a market cap uh, limit to what companies require data sharing? What well, I'm not sure the word sharing? require should be in your sentence at all. Um, but that's or require, or, or to, um, do we encourage data sharing? For I, I don't know how to answer. I, 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 I truly don't know how to answer your questions. What I'm trying to do is uh -huh. raise some questions for okay. you to consider that there are going to be unintended consequences, and you really need to. I would encourage you to get a group of people who, who probably come from a different opinion set than you've had, and and just run those through for a while, mm -hmm. because. If you can't, it's a lovely idea. It's important to share data, okay? It's important for public health to get a lot of things out there. But the second you go too far in the wrong direction, you run the risk of five years or ten years from now looking back and going, oh, my God, we blew the industry. I'm just telling you one way of looking at it. So, Janet, and then we'll go to Steve. So let me just follow up a little bit because I think it's related to what I was trying to say. If you, if you wait until... A drug is approved. I mean, approval isn't a one thing approval. There's approval and then there's an extension. There's all kinds of stuff. But if you want to protect against the kind of thing that Kenneth is talking about, then you need, I think, a lot of people who really understand the data, who can answer questions, who can, or who can set up a system like Matt talked about, which is very expensive. Um, and then the data can go out, and it's much, much less likely to have a serious mistake coming out because they've misinterpreted the data. If you just send a data set out, like lots of data sets are sent out now, in my experience, nobody knows what those variables mean. And that's where really bad decisions and really bad conclusions can be made. Yeah. Steve? Well, I should. I suppose I should preface this by saying I'm sorry for your loss, but uh, <laughs> well, we're not allowed to say things like that. Uh, but uh, so the, it was very, very valuable, interesting presentation. A couple questions: If there was more broad sharing within the biotech, I, I guess I need to understand to what extent the drugs you're developing are informative about each other. So. If you understood, if other companies understood more about why your drug failed, mm -hmm. would that help the whole industry? Would that help you, your future companies or other companies make better choices about this class of drugs? Uh, and the second question is, I didn't 100% understand the, ne the, the liability issue, the, the, the liability-free Right. Repository. I don't, I'm not. I'm not understanding where the liability is. So, so for an abandoned product, as I think you called it, um, or about, uh, the answer is I think that after a company stops a developmental effort, and that happens very often in biotech, 
uh, whether they'd like to continue or not. And frankly, there's often no further investment. You can't get investment because the risk now is perceived as being so, so extraordinarily high by investors that they won't fund it. So you take it and you put it on a shelf. It could be in many cases interesting to make that available in some way. But if, and the lawyers in here can speak to this much better than I, if you hand this data to a third party and somebody figures out a way to say you did something wrong and therefore we're going to sue you on that, you create, a, you create a look back liability that what would happen then is the company's lawyers would say you cannot give that information out. And by the way, think about it differently. I could never get somebody to join my board. I mean, all the ramifications, unintended consequences which would come from that. So giving out data, I mean, I think large pharma, and I think they know it, takes the risk that people will do what's been talked about. Somebody will come up with an analysis, correct or not, but with enough force to say don't use vaccines or don't use this drug or don't use this or don't use that. And that they hope they have the resources and capabilities and statistical analysis strength to counter that before it's too late. A biotechnology company will be DOA because we have no resources, no capabilities. I have 55 people. So the, the first question, how, how informative do uh, the, the studies of, of certain drugs in, in biotech, are, are they about the others? Or are these so different among the various boutiques? I think it depends on the technological area. I've always worked in kind of, not, I'm not in a recombinant DNA monoclonal antibody type of company person. My career has been different. But I think that some of those areas could scientifically in inform other activities as long, again, as you're not saying to a company, give up your competitive advantage because that's another, you know, how do you pay them for that proprietary? That's another risk reward issue. You're actually talking in some ways, and this may be another third we're all of, of taking somebody's intellectual property and handing it over to another company by, by the data set. It's a complex issue. Matt? No, I, I can't speak on behalf of, of Ken's position, but I, I, I've talked with many different companies, both large and small, and throughout not only life sciences but healthcare as well. And first of all, their perspective is, and I don't, I can't represent their perspective directly, but what I take away from their perspective is one: um, oftentimes they're talking about post-decision data, so whether it's already been post-approved or at some point where they feel that they've gotten as much uh, value out of the data and they want to make it available for others for for some sort of research. Or there's uh, opportunities like Project Data Sphere where they're looking at the comparator arm where they feel that there's information that even a subset of it that can still be made available. But on all these, uh, at least on the clinical trial data transparency side, they've set up a, a review panel process by which they feel that they still have somebody who's looking to make sure that, you know, that there is a valid uh, research, a valid approach, and, and that this will be for um, some valid publication in the further healthcare. So there's there are some checks along the way that the, even though they can't control what people will do and, and the negative impact will occur, uh, almost everybody I've talked to has seen, even if they're being driven somewhat by the regulatory aspect of it, that there's positive value and it's worth it to the healthcare industry uh, to do this. I'd only add if you have companies that have set up review, if all of them have set up review panel processes, I would bet you they're bigger than the small biotech companies because they're allocating resources to it and they must be later stage companies, almost all of them, because they're not at this stage of development. They can't be. It's a resource allocation of hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, to something that isn't there yet. Thank you. Uh, Joanne. Okay, so in, in the spirit of, you know, I, I thank you for this, this talk. It's clearly uh, a lightning rod for discussion. And I think just in the spirit of trying to come up with solutions rather than only vetting issues and problems and, and hypothesizing on the death, you know, of a whole industry, um, which I don't think anyone would want. Um, wouldn't a potential solution, I think well, that's what Matt's talking about and what's something that we've been talking about is it, it's not just small companies that can't afford to do this. I think it's also the small clinical trialists, the academic researchers, the NIH funded. So if we all move towards something where it's less expensive to uh, have an independent review panel. You know, if there already is something set up and there's already a mechanism and there's already a database like Datasphere, right? It's already got a database and it's got people who are in charge of it. And there are statisticians and other people on both in Datasphere as well as on the review panel. I mean, is that something that you could foresee? Are there are there solutions that you could foresee? Because I, I think it's hard to reconcile when we've just heard about the public health interest. It's hard to just walk away and just say it's, it's not doable for 
a company that's as small as you know whatever millions of dollars. I, I just want to work towards a solution. So, the question solely the question is what resources you'd need to allocate to prepare for submitting the data to whatever entity you're talking about, um, and. I, I, I don't know what that number is, but right. again, that's just a resource allocation question and a capital allocation question that you either have to make or are, have the option of making. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not cost free. I can't tell you what the costs are. If mm -hmm. you know an estimate, you know I don't know what uh, J and J would estimate to to monitor all of this stuff. I also have to add the question of, and this is only something that the large pharma, which you know, has already thought about this, when the first problem hits, you probably already have a strike team ready to respond to whatever the issues are. I can guarantee no biotech company has the resources to do that. So it's not just the beginning. It's, it's not just the gazinter. It's not what's going into the process. It's mm -hmm. how do you handle the entire process? And that's the question I'm asking. Not saying you can't do it, and certainly for placebo data, for example, sure. you'd like to get that out there on non-drug related data or for failed and closed down clinical research activities. But for an active drug where you're years in the process of building it, how do you handle that? I don't know. Okay. So it's, it's basically a resource issue and then a reaction team kind right. of issue or and, a st skilled statistician yeah. type And those issue. resources take away from investment. That's uh, your, always. That's in, your in choice. Always. In NIH studies as well as small companies as well as large companies, absolutely. So, so I have two brief questions. Can I just get these, Bernie? Uh, uh, or are we are uh, brief? Really so, so Dave and then Ida. That's a question for you. We've talked a lot about how to parse the whole data set into pieces that might be usable. So three, three quick, one, what percent effort do you think it takes you to get up to speed? I mean, you have to get up to speed whether there's data there or not. You just got to be ready for it. So what percent effort does it roughly take to get up to speed on, on handling a data set that's coming to you from the outside? Two, um, what percent of the data in your, from your experience do you actually think you use that you get? And thirdly, how many times does an investigator come and say, I want to write paper two? So the second two questions are easier to answer. Very small number of variables that we actually use, and very few investigators want paper number two. The first is much more difficult because it depends on how much you care about the analysis you're doing. Some analyses don't matter very much. So if you don't understand those data, it doesn't matter that much. But variables that really matter it takes a long time to understand what they are. And what I think both Dave and I know, because we do a lot of data monitoring committees, very often we get data reported to us, and it is clear that whoever is reporting has no idea what these data mean. So to really understand what somebody else's data are is much more complicated than it seems on the surface. So I had a quick question. Ella. Very quick question for Kenneth. Um, if you had to say which was a bigger concern in, in the sort of the survival of your company, is it the capital costs that need to go to some regime like this, or is it the liability risks, or, or are they equal, or can you even just give us a sense which which one is more concerning to you? Well, let's go to uh, it's probably the capital side, but it's not the capital cost; it's the availability of capital. Those are different. It's not but, doesn't, but doesn't that fall into risk? Because if there's more right. risk, you have less capital. Right. So, well, so it's, it's, it's not that we, we have less capital. It's that we may not be able to get it. That's less that, capital. That, yeah, it's less capital yes. because But right. I just wanted to phrase it in the way it works, which is the venture capital industry in biotech is declining, for example. Mm -hmm. um, for and many reasons. Yeah. For many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the life. That's the beginning. That's the seed stage of this industry. So as that becomes harder and harder, you know, you can look at the, the consequences of that. And it's many reasons. It's not. This isn't, you know, there are many, many reasons for that happening. Um, you know, the liability side is, is fixable pretty easily. The investment side is much less readily and easily fixable. Well, I want to thank an excellent panel, very lively discussion, and <coughs> thank you. Bernie?